Welcome to Evolve by Kamlapura Palace Hampi. It is indeed a pleasure to have you with us this evening. It gives us great pleasure to host, along with Deccan Heritage Foundation, an illustrated lecture titled From the American Southwest to India's Deccan Plateau, John M. Fritz at Hampi Vijayanagara, by the eminent architectural historian Dr. George Michel. The late Dr. John M. Fritz was the first American archaeologist to survey the ruins of Hampi Vijayanagara. Trained at the University of Chicago as an anthropologist with a special interest in prehistoric Native American sites in New Mexico and Arizona, Dr. Fritz brought an entirely new perspective to South Asian urban studies. Along with George, Dr. George Michel, Dr. Fritz worked extensively in Hampi, directing a team of volunteer architects and archaeologists for over 20 years. We also have among us Ambassador Fillon, Dr. Helen Fillon, and Mrs. Salos from the Deccan Heritage Foundation. The Deccan Heritage Foundation is a charitable organization established in 2011 that works with the heritage of Deccan region of India through educational and conservation programs to spread awareness and restore and rehabilitate monuments. They have done stellar work in Hampi region including the restoration of Gagan Mahal in Anagodi. Can you hear me? Yeah, get all the technical. So I have to thank, thank all of you here at Evolve for making John Fritz and myself always welcome. And we can only regret that in the, 70, in the 80s and 90s, when we were in the thatched huts, um, this hotel wasn't here. It would have been very welcome, I have to tell you. <laughs> getting a cold drink, getting a bottle of water in the 80s, it was quite a major operation. And uh, Anurad, thank you so much. It's a, it's a little bit humbling for me to be introduced so personally and delightfully by somebody who is, would you believe it, 50 years younger than me. So I don't know whether it makes him feel very young or makes me feel very old, but it is a sort of a, a, a chilling thought that so, much, so many years separate us, but yet we find that we have non-stop discussions, agreements and disagreements, the sort of interactions that you always want. So, um, it's now almost exactly one year ago that John died in London at the end of January. And so, I feel it's the time to come to have some estimation of his contribution to understanding Humpy. Um, for more than 40 years, as many of you know, John and I shared a personal and professional life, and it was our great um, fortune that we could come together and spend three months, if not more, during the winter season at Humpy. And this was only possible because we had no employment back in America and the UK. So this is where unemployment said, <laughs> turned out to be useful. If John had had a regular teaching job, which he had had earlier, or I had, we would never have had the time to come. And Humpy is not a place you can spend one week at and get the hang of it. We had to come for three months. We had to set up a camp, thanks to the government, and we had to welcome countless young people, most of them we had never met before, so we had no idea who they could be, train them and what we want, and so forth. So we had the time to do this work. Now, John, as, as, as we heard, John came from a background of what was called the New Archaeology. This was a movement in American archaeology in which a, a much more symbolic and philosophical approach to past artifacts and structures. And it placed a lot of emphasis on meticulous documentation. Where were these artifacts exactly? How could the spatial arrangement and distribution of them give us information? And by the time I met John, he was working in New Mexico, working on this prehistoric, that pre-Columbian remains. And prehistoric meaning that there was no history so John was looking at things for which he could provide no history. So let's have a look here. Let me get all this technology going. 
This was the landscape that John was working in when I met him in 1980. You're looking at this dry, arid landscape of New Mexico. And it has also, this is in uh, the US, and it has this sort of sandstone outcrops. You see it's rugged, it's dry, it's rather dramatic. And here is a sort of picture of where we are. Here is the US, this bit is New Mexico, and here is New Mexico, and this is Chaco. Chaco was a particularly important site. It had a sort of valley, here is a valley, with lots of, of rocky hills, and all these things, little dots with two letters, represent prehistoric sites with what was known as great houses, structures for which we do not exactly know the purpose, but had a ritual purpose. This is an example of the sort of thing that John was looking at. This is Casa Rinconada. It has a Spanish name given to it by the, by, this, by the Spaniards later. We don't know what it was called at the time. And the date of these structures seems to be 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th. Those sorts of centuries which we know in South India were, of course, a brilliant era. Chalukyas and Cholas and so forth. But in this part of the world, there's no history. We don't know the name of the people, we don't know the languages they spoke, and we don't know the beliefs. This area is now occupied more, or more recently by the Hopi Indians, but we don't know if the Hopis are actually descendants of these Chaco Canyon people. So no matter, John decided that he would examine and think about these, and he made drawings like this. You can see this circular sort of hole set down beneath with little chambers. And this, this is called a kiva. A kiva is a sort of a, a ritual ceremonial place, and all we have are the walls of it. There would have been thatch and wooden roof. That's all been lost. And this is the most spectacular of the, um, of the Pueblo Bonito, it's called, this is the largest and most spectacular prehistoric structure in the United States. And this is in the Chaco Canyon part of New Mexico. And you can see, whoops, hang on. It has lots of these circular pits, which were these kivas, these ceremonial places where communities met, maybe they worshipped, maybe they discussed things. Um, we don't know, we can only guess. And this is a map of this Casa Rinconada, and John was very fascinated by the symmetry, how this side mirrors that side. So he decided to get interested in layout, symmetry, and landscape. How does this relate to the hills around? Here is another one of these structures on top of a hill, and then from these structures, John started to develop these ideas of alignments, that some of these great houses were arranged like this, and others had a sort of mirror symmetry, these ones which were half circular, that they were arranged. So something was going on with geometry, alignment, and landscape, and probably the heavens, even though he couldn't be very precise about it. So this was a sort of, in the mind of John, in this prehistoric society, we met um, in the spring of 1980, and by the 1st of January 1981, John arrived here. He had absolutely no background of history, of India, of architecture, of archaeology, anything. He came completely blank as far as India was concerned, but filled with ideas of looking at landscape, alignments, symmetries, and all these sorts of things. And this, in the way, as I would like to show, helped inform John about how to proceed to make interpretations of Humpy. So the first thing that John noticed was that this was a landscape charged with mythological meaning. And all of you who know Humpy know more about it than I do, about this Ramayana associations. This is the Sugriva cave, that here there is a, a natural cavern which is linked with a legend. And of course on the hilltop we have the birthplace of Hanuman. So these are all things that suddenly the landscape is charged with this sort of meaning. And then we have the landscape itself is actually cut and carved and fashioned into shapes which have meaning. And this, of course, is a mandala, a sacred diagram with lingas. Some of you may have been to it. It's Kotilinga. It's near to the river. 
and when the river floods, water washes over it. So there was this sort of like the river itself is worshipping images. And we have Vishnu reclining on the serpent on another boulder near to the river. So here the, um, the legend of um, the cosmic ocean and the Tungabhadra river come together. And of course, our friend Hanuman, he's all over the place, um, <laughs> defiant, wonderful carvings on the rock. And this rather marvelous um, ensemble of the main characters in the Ramayana story, Rama, Lakshmana, and Sita, carved on a boulder, in, now inside a temple, but probably an outside boulder originally. And as you can see from the saris, the garlands, and the crowns, very much in worship today. So this is a system that was in existence in the past and has continued on into the present day. So all this was very interesting for John. Suddenly he could observe and realize how the landscape worked. So being an archaeologist, the first problem was to make a map. Where were all these things? Where, how could they be located? And there was no professional map available. I won't go into the details how we got this map going, but we did manage to make a, I would say, a fairly accurate, not a fully accurate map. This is our, one of our very first maps. Five kilometers across, five kilometers down. So um, we are out there somewhere. Here is Anagondi, and here is the river. You can see the Tunga Badra is up there. And here are all these rocky outcrops with these great temples, Hampi, Bala Krishna, Achutaraya, Vitala. And so John and I decided we should call that the sacred center. And it was separated from the rest of the city by this agricultural zone, which some of you may not have noticed with all these um, canals running through, the, the water coming from the upper part of the Tunga Badra flowing through the site like this. And we have no evidence of architecture in this area. It's as if this was a sort of agricultural zone which separated the sacred center from the urban core. This is the complete walls around the city. And you can see it's highly irregular because it responds to the landscape. So wherever possible, they run the walls along the ridges, you see, like this. And between the ridges, little straight bits, another straight bit, again around, around the uh, ridges and more straight here as the landscape opens up. And at one end of the urban core, we have these structures, this sort of palace zone, which we call the royal center. So John and I developed this sort of conceptual idea that this is a city divided into zones. They are not geometric zones. They are zones that respond to the landscape, the legendary um, associations of the landscape, and also the royal activities that made this a, an imperial capital. And John started to look at the surface. Now, as an archaeologist, he was trained to excavate. This is what you normally do if you're an archaeologist. So um, at Humpy, you could take five square meters and dig down, and you would find interesting things. But here we're dealing with 25 square kilometers of ruins. It would have been quite pointless to dig down. In any case, um, our friends who are from the state archaeology and central government archaeology, they were doing excavations. So they were doing that job with local laborers. It was not something that John and I could do. So John rethought, as an archaeologist, what could he do? So he decided instead of going vertically down, he could go horizontally across. And he developed this technique which he called surface archaeology, which meant examining every bit of the surface of Humpy. Not an easy task, because not only is it a very large area, it's a very rugged area. So this sort of naked, rocky bedrock, we have all over the site. And you might think it's completely useless to look at it, but John argued, not at all. We should make a real effort to see what's on the surface. And so he commissioned a set of topographic maps. So this is a map showing the boulders of one bit of the site, very rugged. And 
he's made these maps, had these maps made by a professional topographic survey company in Bangalore who used old-fashioned British-era type of surveying techniques, things that you would not see anymore today, plane table and trigonometry and measuring tapes. You know, it's all sort of gone these days. But in the 90s, this was the way we mapped the site. And we produced almost 300 of these maps they were to the scale of 1 to 400. And on each map, John had numbers. See all these red numbers? So he had the students and volunteers take these maps, wander across the surface, and look down. Wherever they saw anything that was man-made, they would put a number and describe what it was. And it could vary from just a scratch to a fallen structure. This is the sort of thing that happened. You see, this is a tie bar for tying up animals. These are holes for pounding grain, mortars. And John argued that if we could document all these, we would start to get an idea of maybe that people lived here, even though there are no more houses. There's nothing left here to see, probably because it was in mud and thatch and whatever, but there are these indications on the surface of the rock. And we have, I think, almost 30,000 entries in a database, and we have 300 maps, and the project um, we have now is to finish the corrections. We have Surendra Kumar here, who is our photographer and technical assistant, and Suri is now finishing off all of John's corrections, and within the next five or six months, we should have finished this Vijinagara archaeological atlas, and this will be the most detailed survey surface survey of any historical site in India. And now we are looking for a host, somebody who will manage it, and then eventually a sponsor who will help pay for it. Because we want to issue it digitally, and we also want to issue a limited number of paper copies with great big boxes of maps. Because who knows in 20 years' time if the digital system will be... But if it's in paper, it will be there forever. So that's a project that Surrender and I are hoping to finish off in John's um, memory. So having got the mapping, the mapping and the surface archaeology project going, and this went on for almost 10, 12 years with hundreds of young people going across the site, making all these entries, and John checking all these things. It was a huge job. John then turned to the Royal Centre. And here you have a general view. Most of you know what you're looking at. This is the um, Ramachandra temple in the middle of the site, and these are the revealed basements of various types of structures. But we can't be sure what they were, how, what they were intended for, and how they were used. So John went, um, anyhow, let's think about the temple to begin with. So these are the two main shrines, and those of us who were there yesterday, we discussed how very Tamil they are, that they were built in a style that imported um, the techniques and styles of a, of a region that was under the control of the Vijayanagara emperors. This is the main shrine of Rama, and another shrine that they were not 100% who it was dedicated to. Normally it would be to a goddess, but it doesn't seem to have been the case. And the interesting thing, the fascinating thing about this temple, in the middle of the royal center, it presents a non-religious exterior. When you approach the temple, you are in the realm of the king. This is what you see. You don't see gods. You don't see heavenly legendary images. You see all the things to do with the world of the king. This is the brick tower of the temple inside. This is the granite wall on the outside. And we have, of course, all these processions of elephants, horses, military contingents, and dancing women, all progressing in a clockwise direction towards seated figures who are probably the ruler or the queen receiving them. So this is the sort of, inside this imagery of royal life, we then have Rama. So the temple itself has legendary um, depictions, and these are scenes from the Ramayana. They run in three rows around the temple. So it's as if the world of Rama is contained within the world of the king. So I think John developed the idea, we're not uh, so interested in saying the, the king was, was 
identified with Rama, but rather the realm of the king, of the ruler, of Vijayanagara Empire, was in some way coincided with the realm of the god. So there was a sort of coincidence of these things.